Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, those of you that haven't been uh, to our, uh, the latest iteration of our Arlington <coughs> campus, a uh, very warm welcome. Uh, this auditorium has now been up for all of one year, and uh, we're uh, proud of it, and we're very pleased to welcome all of you. Um, uh, as most of you know, or uh, if you don't know it, Take note. Uh, we are accustomed at George Mason Law School to uh, uh, having uh, uh, programs that are intellectually demanding and uh, uh, thought provoking and uh, learning. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to be having fun, which is a bit unusual, especially given the uh, ages of the law school for, for this event. Um, it's uh, Entrepreneurs compete on platforms. This is a story, obviously, of uh, uh, warfare uh, right at tooth and claw, which uh, probably explains why all of uh, 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 you are here and that uh, some of you came from uh, the far corners of the country. Uh, in any event, I'm not going to uh, uh, take a lot of time. I do want to uh, thank all of the thank you staff. Sarah O, thank you very much for pulling this together. And I now uh, yield the platform to the, uh, uh, the entrepreneur uh, who brought us the Information Economy Summit in this program, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Hagler. Uh, thanks very much. I'm glad I put on my name tag so the dean knew who, who I was. And we're delighted to be in our, our new building. Uh, it's beautiful. And uh, actually, we don't care about the new building, do we? No. I never use this new building except for great conferences like this. What we care about? Well, while they were building it for three years, they took away our parking. And now our parking's back, so we're delighted. As you all know, it's, it's all about the parking. Um, Seventy years ago, Joseph Schumpeter uh, wrote a modest little book that he actually took to be uh, just a popular monograph, a slight diversion from his academic career, uh, but it became uh, his most enduring contribution uh, to political economy. In Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, he outlined a new view of markets, one that departed radically uh, from the formal theory of competitive markets. Uh, framework that he had actually done so much early in his career uh, to advance. Schumpeter argued, quite simply, that the main aim of economic policy was to promote, simply, steady economic growth. At 2% per capita annual growth, a country becomes eight times wealthier over the course of a century. That was all the empirics Schumpeter needed to decide what was important. Uh, of course, there's a little more than one devil in the details. What was indeed most impressive about Schumpeter's uh, insight was how quickly he was forced to abandon traditional economic theory to begin to explain how that growth would take place. It would not rely on the optimization of a given set of tools, but on the discovery of new tools, the creation of previously unimagined products, and the creation of innovative forms of organization that would revolutionize the economy. And not once, not twice, but continuously and throughout generations. The results of these dynamic improvements uh, could be plotted with the models of economists, but could not really be understood. Indeed, the enormity of the task, understanding <coughs> the process of social and economic innovation, went far beyond what any one discipline might truly encompass. At least three intersections were of immediate interest the margin between industry and science that drove technological advance, the contour connecting economics and strategy drove market transformation, and the edge where antitrust, such as intellectual property, we found, drives public policy. In short, growth is a complex topic with valued insights bubbling up from a, across a wide and rocky landscape. But it remains key to understanding the modern economy and what divides successful from unsuccessful outcomes. 
Surely the U.S. today is keenly aware and keenly interested in the dynamics that Schumpeter once pointed to as the central force in economic advance. So today, through the hard work of Sarah O. Oh, uh, and the assistance of the George Mason University Law School working with the uh, Information Economy Project uh, and some uh, hardworking students from the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy published here at Mason, uh, we really have the optimal, that's optimal at a point in time, uh, optimal group of speakers uh, assembled uh, to explain what progress has been made in understanding the forces of invention, innovation, and economic growth. I should mention that the papers from today are headed for a special issue of the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy, and a video copy of this conference. <laughs> Sarah wisely nodded yes when I looked at her. She knew I was clueless if it was audio or video, yes. A video copy of the conference will be posted on the website of the Information Economy Project at the George Mason Law School. So I thank you all very much for coming and being here today. Uh, to introduce our first speaker, I will say very little, as little need be said, Professor Richard Langlois from the University uh, of Connecticut, Department of Economics, is a very well-known scholar uh, to all who deal with these issues of business strategy and economic development. He has spent a career, in essence, fleshing out the Schumpeterian insights, and he uh, has written much, uh, as much, and I should say as wisely as any other person, in describing how markets work to accommodate new products, new competition, and new rivalry. Uh, in what Schumpeter called forms of organization. So it is really with great pleasure that I welcome and introduce to you Professor Richard Langlois. Richard. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Dean. Thank you, everyone, for, um, for inviting me to what seems is going to be a fascinating conference. And I'm looking forward to learning uh, from the other participants uh, who um, know a lot of things that know a lot of things that I don't know. What I would like to do is to pick up on what Tom was just talking about, which is um, Schumpeter, which is the idea of uh, economic growth. And the, the key idea of this uh, session is the idea of a platform. So I, I tried to think about the idea of platforms in the context of, of Schumpeterian, uh, uh, of Schumpeter's view of the world as, of, of capitalism as creative destruction. And I happen to be reading this new book by the uh, historian Neil Ferguson, which is called Civilization. And uh, the way Ferguson, especially if you, if you kind of watch the videos of him discussing this book online, the way Ferguson talks about his thesis in the book is that Western civilization, meaning Western, especially Northwestern Europe, came up with six killer apps that in, in the early modern period that are what led to economic growth and led to what historians refer to as the great divergence between uh, the West and other parts of the world that, that didn't engage in sustained intensive economic growth as um, as quickly, uh, killer apps like competition, science, property rights, medicine, the consumer society, and the work ethic. Um, this is, of course, kept meant to be catchy, and you're all probably thinking, are these really apps? And in fact, I know what, what you're all thinking. These aren't really apps. These are really platforms. Right? These are... <clears throat> um, systems on which people can innovate. These are systems on which people can, uh, that are frameworks of some sort that people historically use to create what we might think of as apps. So what kinds of apps could you, could you build on these, these more abstract platforms? Well, things like with competition, you can have um, global explore, exploration. With science, you can have the theory of evolution. With property rights, you could have the enclosure movement. With medicine, you could have pasteurization. Right? With technology, you could have mantle clocks. And with, 
the work ethic, you could, <clears throat> you could have factory discipline. And these are, the, these are really the apps that were built on platforms. Now you might say, what does this have to do with the kind of platforms we're talking about here? And isn't this rather fuzzy headed to talk about these very vague things as either apps or platforms? Well, um, I think as you'll hear today, <coughs> don't want to stray too far from the microphone, as you'll hear today, um, platforms have a rather narrower meaning or a couple of sets of meanings. Uh, in law and economics, platforms tend to refer to special kinds of markets. Markets that are, that, that require, spe that have special problems of coordination, especially coordinating uh, complementary activities. Um, and We'll hear, we'll hear more about that uh, later today, I'm, I'm sure. What I wanted to talk a little bit more about, and, and maybe connect these two together a little bit, but to talk more about <clears throat> the idea of a platform as you would learn about it if you were uh, studying platforms in the context of, of, a, st of a strategy course or uh, management, of, management of technology. <coughs> and here, platform tends to, to mean not to think when people talk about platforms, they tend to think not in terms of the, the coordination problems, although that's always there, but to think in terms of the technology itself and the way the system is organized and the way the system is put together. In one definition, it sounds almost as abstract as, as Neil Ferguson, right, is that a platform is a stable set of components that supports variety and evolvability in a system by constraining the linkages among the other components. Right? So some components are stable and there are connections that, com that, that constrain the way those components interact with other components. And that obviously you can see that that's not unrelated to the economics view, that somehow this has to do with complementarity, it has to do with special problems of uh, of coordination, but it's much more interested in the design of the system itself, not just the, taking, the taking the system as given and asking how do we solve the coordination problem, but rather thinking about the design of the, design of the system itself. Okay? Now, both of these literatures arguably um, trace back to um, the literature on, on uh, <clears throat> lock-in uh, standards and network effects that goes back to the 1980s. Uh, there was a lot of work that was done in, in economics <clears throat> in the mid-80s. Probably you, you've all heard of the most famous story here, which is Paul <coughs> David's uh, much discussed account of the, uh, the QWERTY keyboard, right? And the idea here is, well, there are network effects there's lock-in to a particular platform <clears throat> because uh, it, it's costly. Once you have acquired um, complementary assets, it's costly to change to a different set of complementary assets. In the case of <clears throat> typewriters and keyboards, the, the assets are typewriters with a certain keyboard layout on the one hand, the physical system, but more importantly, the software. So these, are, these were often hardware software <coughs> platforms, right? Where the hardware is the keyboard design and the software is actually the touch typing skills. Uh, it's actually very hard. It's harder to uh, learn to touch type on a new keyboard than if you've already learned an old keyboard than it is if you haven't learned any touch typing at all. So there, it's very costly to switch, to migrate from one platform to the other. And in this literature, the, the main focus, well, was, was this problem of coordination that um, there was great danger. And what, what was emphasized in this literature was the great danger of being locked into a technological standard to a platform <clears throat> and not being able to get out again, especially if the one that you're locked into isn't the best possible one. Right, so this was a very kind of pessimistic literature, if you will, about about platforms, saying, "Well, you're always going to get you're always going to get locked in, and you might get locked into the wrong one, 
and, and Paul David made uh, tried to make an argument about why the QWERTY keyboard that we use is inferior to the, the Dvorak um, keyboard. Uh, that argument had a lot of problems along a number of dimensions, including um, the, the, the fact of economic history that Paul David was using to support this. But that was the tenure of the, the tenor of the, uh, of the argument was that, you know, we, that, that platforms are dangerous sorts of things because we get locked into them and then we can't get out of them. Um, but a large literature, both in economics and in, um, in, in uh, business schools, started to look at this, uh, got really interested in this idea of technological, um, technological standards. And one direction, especially in the, the strategy, management of technology direction, uh, was to say, well, let's think about this problem of lock-in as a problem of innovation, right? So how do you change? How do you innovate in a system where you've got the uh, where the pieces are all laid out and the, the interconnections between the pieces are all laid out? Um, <clears throat> and thinking this way helped to broaden what had been the older way of thinking about innovation in the literature. There used to be an older literature which talked about incremental literature versus uh, uh, incremental innovation versus radical innovation. So Joseph Schumpeter was always hailed as a prophet of radical innovation that, that uh, you, in um, these, you know, that, that things change very radically, <clears throat> whereas um, other economic historians you know, like Nate Rosenberg and people like that would say, well, you know, it's actually a lot more incremental, lots of small changes, learning by doing over time. Uh, <clears throat> but if you think about this in terms of a, of, a, of a platform, you can think along another dimension. You can think about innovation that changes the nature of the platform, that rearranges the pieces, or you could think about innovation that keeps the, plat the architecture of the platform constant and just makes the pieces better. Maybe take some out and plug some new ones in. All right, it's a little real. This is a little related to, to uh, what <coughs> David Teese has referred to as systemic versus autonomous innovation. Although I think that distinction is maybe a little richer than, than, um, than this distinction. So it, this put the focus on the idea of innovation. And uh, as this literature progressed, it began to focus more and more on the organization of the system itself. Right? Not so much on the coordination problem, but more, again, I'm talking about the technology literature here, not the, not the law and economics literature. The technology literature began to focus more and more on the, on the structure or the architecture of these platforms and to think of them as modular systems. Right? This is something that, like many of the interesting ideas one runs across in thinking about systems, this, these are ideas that Herbert Simon had talked about a long time ago. Um, and, and a lot of you know, what people have been doing since then have been kind of footnotes on Herbert Simon. But thinking about um, why you would take a complex system and make it modular. And of course, what, what modular means in this context, right, and it, it's not unrelated to the, to, you know, to the typewriter problem. Mo what modular means is that you carve, you, you uh, carve up the system in a very particular way, right? If you think about um, making any kind of a product, um, you can make that product in an integral way, that is in a way where everything is connected to everything else, Right, so if you think of a bowl of spaghetti, right, a bowl of spaghetti is a very integral product because everything is kind of connected to everything else. But if you design something carefully, you can you can design it in such a way that you and I'll come back to this in a minute that you can take some very complex pieces of the system and put them inside of modules and then connect the modules together with very lean interfaces at what Carlos Baldwin calls thin crossing points. 
and and use the essentially use a, a, a much more um, lean and and uh, low transaction cost way of connecting these modules together. Now this will give you a platform. It will give you maybe even a you know especially if, if the if this is a, a platform that relies on. Um, on, on technological standards. So it certainly is true in this literature that there is a trade-off between the benefits of modular innovation on the one hand and the benefits of systemic innovation on the other hand. That is, if you lock yourself into a, a particular design of a modular system, then that's going to influence the direction of technological change. Right? And this is what people were, were um, obsessed with in the in the 1980s, if you lock yourself into one kind of structure, it's going to you can you can improve that structure, you can make the modules better, um, but you're locked into that you know, you, or you can even add new modules, but you you're locked into that structure. Um, on the other hand, there are lots of benefits to that kind of innovation, and what I want to stress is actually that sort of contrary to the message of the 1980s um, lock-in standards literature, that modular innovation, one can argue, uh, is actually in many ways the much more Schumpeterian and transformative kind of innovation, or it can be under, it can be under some circumstances. And the reason for this, or one way to, one way to think about it uh, is, is the way Carlos Baldwin likes to think about it, which is uh, that mod a modular system has tremendous option value. Right? It actually comes out of finance. It's just really literally thinking in terms of real options theory. And the idea is, uh, you know, loosely speaking, that if you have a modular system with many, many parts, that are under control, and I'll come back to that in a minute, under the control of many different <coughs> people, right? You are actually uh, using knowledge from many, many different parts of the economy rather than using knowledge from within the system. And you are also placing, uh, you're playing, ex uh, you're engaging in experiments or placing bets, right? Many, many more of these bets than you would be placing inside the system. And so as a result, uh, you learn much faster. So you get much faster trial and error learning in a system that's very decentralized. And this is something that, you know, in the 80s, people would not have thought about, but it's sort of second nature now to think about cloud sourcing, right? So this is, in a, in a sense, what this is suggesting is uh, you can actually get a much more transformative system, even though you're locked in, right? Even though you may be locked into you know, Microsoft and, and the Wintel standard, right, and, and the current backbones for, um, for the internet, you can still get tremendous, uh, you can still create uh, tremendous unexpected, uh, unexpected value by trying all these different experiments within that, um, within that framework. And in the strategy part of this literature, um, <coughs> in the strategy part of this literature, there, uh, there is a little bit of overlap with the more law and economics approach, right? In the law and economics approach, the question is, well, how do you think about <coughs> um, pricing and competition in, in platform markets, right? So, so it's all about, uh, are, people, are people extracting rents from these markets? Um, you know, if, if people price in odd ways, and, and, and I think one of the messages of the law and economics literature on platforms is, we sh is that we should expect to see people price in odd ways and use odd kinds of arrangements like tying arrangements to solve these coordination problems. Right? So, it, so, it's a, so it, the focus is on um, uh, how do we manage competition and who earns the, the, uh, the economic rents. Well, that's the way strategy thinks about it too. But they think about it in strategy in a slightly different way. They think about, uh, <coughs> about ownership. And um, if you've got a system that's, if you've got a, a widely dispersed modular system with many, many parts to it, um, 
which parts do you want to own in order to earn the economic rents, and which parts aren't going to earn you the, uh, the economic rent. So that tends to be the discussion. And of course, as you might expect, what, what people recommend is owning the bottlenecks, right? So if you own something that is a standard, like, um, like the operating system or the, um, the, um, right, the CPU, the, the microprocessor, which has its own sets of standards, you c you're likely to be a, a bottleneck in the system, and you're likely to earn more economic rents than if you are, th than if you are an easily replaceable um, component. And all of this suggests in that um, maybe these these um, platforms, even though they are standardized and you are in some sense locked into an architecture, that these standards. Uh, that these platforms, rather, can be transformative in a Schumpeterian sense, that they, that they can change the industry, perhaps even have more ability to change the industry than um, a, a world where we can move the system around and not let, get locked into the system. And the famous story here is, um, you know, w was first um, put forward clearly by Andy Grove from Intel, who says, well, look what happened to the computer industry because of the adoption of the personal computer, which was a standardized modular system, the Wintel architecture. Everybody's got to fit into this system. Everybody's got to obey the standards. But what happened is you got the famous transformation from vertical silos on the one hand where large computer companies like IBM or DEC or Sperry um, were, would in-house undertake each of the relevant stages of production. Right? So um, you know they, they, they would fabricate a lot of their own chips, they would put the computer hardware together themselves, they wrote their own operating system they would write their own software, they would have their own sales and distribution. Right? That got transformed into a world, very famously, in which um, there was a lot of vertical specialization. Right? So, so one of the first kind of, if you will, supply side insights about these modular systems or platforms is that they have the ability to change the vertical division of labor. That they, that they tend to, um, for a variety of reasons, tend to lead to more vertical um, disintegration. And of course, the reason is that at the, these interfaces, you get those, le these, those lean interfaces I was talking about. The standards come into play between these levels, and they lower the transaction cost of coordinating among the levels, which means that it makes sense to break these levels apart. And you can then use knowledge from many, many different entities. You can go all, you can source all over the world. You can cloud source. You can use the intelligence of people all over the world to come up with, um, to come up with new ideas in each of these modules. And you're not limited by what knowledge is, lies inside even these big, capable, um, these big capable um, firms, and, and I argue that this has been something of a, a tendency that's driven by growth in the extent of the market, what I call the, the vanishing hand, that we, we have gone largely from a world of, of large vertically integrated corporations of the kind that Alfred Chandler described to a much more vertically disintegrated world. Many of these companies, by the way, um, uh, are are large, right? So, you know, Dell, HP, um, Microsoft are all very large in terms of of market cap, right? But they don't. They're not large in the in the sense of Ronald Coase. They're not large in the sense that they that they're highly vertically integrated in the way that uh, in the way that firms in the way that firms once um, once were. 
right? So it's not about size, it's about, it's about vertical, uh, the way industries are controlled vertically. Um, why does this happen? Well, I've already given you a story about rapid trial and error learning that um, you can take it if you create a modular system, even though you lock yourself in, you uh, can take advantage of so much more uh, knowledge within the economy that you can that you can grow much much faster. Uh, another way to think about it, and it's really very closely related, is to think more about what a modular system is, and a modular system, if, uh, if you come right down to it, is, is about ways of hiding complexity. That complexity, if we have a, if we have a system that gets, and if, when we think about technological change, we think about systems becoming more and more complex, right? That's sort of the 19th century steampunk vision of innovation. Right, so, so if you think about the way people thought about innovation in the 19th century, you have these bigger, big, bigger and bigger Rube Goldberg steam-powered, you know, machines, right? And, and of course, this is the way people thought about it. People like John Kenneth Galbraith thought about it well into the into the 20th century, but in fact, if if you read Adam Smith, Smith thought about innovation as making things much simpler, doing the same thing in a much simpler way. And of course, in the late 20th century, we started to think that way too, that innovation is actually about making things simpler and smaller, right? But what does that mean? Those systems are more complex. They're much more com are Your cell phone, right, is a much more complex system than one of these giant 19th century steam-driven Rube Goldberg machines, yet it fits in your, it fits in your um, right, it fits in your coat pocket. Um, how can that be? And the answer is, well, it has to be modularized in some way so that the complexity is hidden in, in inside these uh, inside these modules. And this is an idea that comes from software design, which is that that uh, a well-designed system is one where you encapsulate uh, complex knowledge, um, keep it inside the modules, and you don't, in fact, even let the modules communicate with one another except through standardized um, interfaces and, and you basically hide information from people. Right? And so that's you know, certainly true if we think about, about object-oriented programming. The idea is within your object, you don't want to let outsiders get into your in APIs inside because then they could do something that's going to screw up the whole system. You want to keep your stuff separate and you want to talk to the, um, the other modules only through official channels. So very, very lean, standardized official channel. Uh, my, my argument is this happens in, not in places other than, um, places other than electronics and then it's a more general uh, it's a more general idea. And this is part of this idea of the vanishing hand that I was trying to, uh, to sell to you. Here's another, and, and nowadays, much more, in some ways, even more relevant um, story about transformation from silos to, uh, to a modular network. Okay, so think about mortgage banking. If you go back to the time of Jimmy Stewart, right, or even into the 1960s, um, it was the case that um, the, 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 the entire chain of production of intermediation for mortgage lending would take place inside of a silo. And the silo would be your local bank or savings and loan association. Right? So the same bank would um, identify the lenders, the lenders being the people who come and deposit their money. These people here who were anxious to get their deposits back, they're the lenders. Right, so the bank would identify them. Um, it would find borrowers and sort them into good and bad borrowers. It would assess the credit worthiness of the borrowers. Right, it would close the loan. Then it would service the loan, right, send you out these little payment booklets and you would send the money back. Right, and then, it, then the bank would also figure out how to pay back these people, right, pay these people interest on their um, on their savings deposits in that system, which Jimmy Stewart explains in the movie, 
right? That system worked inside the silo. Well, you all know the story um, that um, starting in the late 1960s, it act this actually started, as I understand it, under the, the end of the Johnson administration. Um, for a variety of reasons, mostly I, that actually that had to do with <clears throat> finding, and I'll come back to this in a minute, identifying lenders, um, they decided to um, find a new class of lenders by turning these mortgages into securities, right? And how do you do that? Well, you have to, you have to do what happened in the personal computer industry. You have to create technical standards that allow you to separate the different stages and let those stages communicate through lean interfaces, that is through markets, right? So, so we had to standardize, people had to figure out how to standardize what these things meant Right, especially things like credit worthiness, um, even subtle things like how do you handle defaults and so on. Uh, all of these things become, become standardized. Then things like identifying the borrowers is something you can spin off to specialized mortgage agents. Um, servicing the loan, that's easy. That's just a back office operation. Uh, it's completely transparent. Right, and then dealing with the lenders can be, uh, you can actually undertake through, um, through securities markets, right? And uh, Michael Jacobides wrote about this um, just before the mortgage crisis. He talked about um, mortgage banking as exactly this kind of modular system. And what I want to highlight here is that this was about information hiding. Right? And this is why the system worked just like it works in software. That, that what allowed the system to work is that you didn't have to inquire about the credit worthiness of these, um, of, of these borrowers right? it, whose, whose assets are in this, this, this mortgage-backed security. Right? The idea is you can now treat this as a module. Right? And in fact, you can treat it as um, what um, um, some monetary economists call informationally insensitive assets, okay? And this was transformative, I want to argue, in exactly the same way that, the, that Andy Grove's computer industry transformation was transformative, right? Um, and why did it work? Well, first of all, it worked because, uh, because of growth and the extent of the market. That is, one of the things behind the scenes in in the financial crisis was a number of things. One was the growing demand for people to be, uh, to be lenders. That is, people who wanted safe places, safe and informationally uh, insensitive places to put their money. Bank accounts, basically. Right? So, he, so last night I stayed at next door at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, where they have a dormitory, they have a hotel. Right? Well, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation ensures safe, um, um, safe bank accounts, right? makes bank accounts safe because it insures them. And so you don't have to inquire about the credit worthiness of your bank because you know that up to whatever it is, $200,000, that the FDIC will insure your loan if the bank goes out of business. But what about... Um, big corporations and, and mutual funds and uh, all kinds of other lenders who have needs to put money in those kinds of safe assets for a very short term, they need, there's a, there's a demand, what economists call the, the safe asset share. And in fact, the, the share of safe assets has stayed constant as the economy has grown, which means that the share of state safe assets, the demand for safe assets has outstripped the banking system, right? If you're a big company, FDIC the insurance doesn't do much for you, right? And um, you, there's only so many treasury bills you can buy. So the, the demand for safe securities has, uh, has outdistanced that market. So part of this transformation in mortgage banking was to, and there's obviously lots more to the story, right, of the financial crisis. But one part of the story is that um, 
by creating these mortgage-backed securities, this, the financial system was creating a modular system, right? It's creating a platform, if you will, in which the uh, the securities were were opaque and intentionally opaque. That is, they were intended to be securities that you didn't have to look beyond. You didn't have to look inside the black box. They were encapsulated, right? Uh, and, and so why didn't you have to look inside the black box? And part of the answer here is that the rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and so on, were by statute given the stamp of approval to, to, to certify assets as uh, safe, right? To say they, if, if you get a AAA rating from Moody's, that's saying don't look inside this black box. You don't have to look inside of it. Right? It's, actually, it's actually very safe. And of course, we now, in hindsight, we know the story um, that because of, of the very low interest rates that were going on, the, the Fed policy led to extremely low, in fact, negative real interest rates for many years after the dot-com bubble. Uh, the financial industry was looking for new ways to make money because you can't make money in fixed income securities if you, the real interest rate is negative. So they came up with this, this scheme of taking what were actually risky securities, getting them whitewashed through the, through the uh, rating agencies, and selling them as these opaque, perfectly trustworthy, perfectly safe assets. And of course, that led to, uh, in the end, that led to the crash. Um, but if you're kind of software computer guys, don't get complacent, because there was a crash in the dot-com era as well. Okay, it probably wasn't quite as bad because there wasn't as much leverage going on, right? That what made the current crisis worse was the, the extent of the extent to which the banks actually held some of these secured oddly, perhaps. The banks continued to hold some of these securities themselves, um, and it was basically a run on what economists call the shadow banking system. But um, you know, leverage aside, if something similar happened in the dot-com bubble. And one way to think about this is, to say, is, to, is uh, actually, in a sense, to go back to, to Ferguson, right? That once you create these platforms, right? You know, it's sort of, it's in, in a sense, it is kind of the opposite of the sense of what we were told about about platforms in the 1980s. In the 1980s, we were told these platforms are monopolies; they are they are constraining us. Right, they are um, uh, they are locking us into something that's inefficient. Right, we should do something about that. Right, what we've seen <coughs> since then is is more exactly the opposite. That these platforms, um, you know, are so, have so full of this option value that we don't really know how to price the option value. Right, <coughs> that in the dot com era, uh, investors didn't know how to price the option value of the internet and the personal computer and the digital communications revolution, those platforms didn't know how to price the option value of those platforms and certainly didn't know how to price the option value of financial innovations that came from creating this platform, this modular system in, um, in financial instruments more, more recently. So in some ways, I guess if there's a, a single theme of what I want to say here is that um, you know, lock-in is not what we need to worry about, right? In fact, it's excessive innovative potential, maybe <coughs> excessive, excessive in quotes, right? These are both very complicated stories that I'm, that I'm glossing over here, right? We could spend a lot of time talking about these stories, but, but the massive Schumpeterian innovative potential um, in, in, in platforms is the other side of the coin, and that may that may dominate everything else. That may be the much more important, that might be the much more important side of the coin. Thank you. Very much, Richard. That was a great way to get things kicked off today and very thought provoking. Uh, Professor Josh Wright will now introduce the next panel. And uh, if the panelists want to come up to the stage. <laughs>